All right, so next up I have Heather Paddock from our, she's our central program engineer for region four, which is the um, northeast quadrant of our state. Heather's in charge of the I-7, or the I-25 corridor between Denver and Fort Collins. Um, that's our primary central highway that goes north-south through Colorado. She's also heavily involved with the I-70 Resilience Pilot Project, which is looking at a corridor approach to the I-70 um, corridor through our state, which is the primary east-west route through our state. It's a very dynamic route. It goes from everything from plains and flooding issues out to the east to the rockfall issues that you were seeing through the major corridors like Ty was showing earlier. Um, it's really taking a bigger look at user costs and where the pinch points and the redundancy is in the system and how we can look at finite points along the entire network and build resiliency in there in order to improve uh, transportation on that corridor. She's also directly in charge of the 2013 floods, which I think I'm gonna say this, it's probably the largest disaster we've had in the state in the last 40 years. I'm gonna say that. Um, we're still recovering from it uh, almost four years later. So I would like to introduce Heather Paddock and she will be presenting on Bridging the Gap to Resilience. How many are familiar with the 2013 flood event that happened in Colorado? All right, cool. So I am a roadway engineer. Um, that's at least how I um, started in this industry. And I don't know if you structure engineers feel the same way that I feel about roadway engineer, but every transportation project is a roadway project. But if you ask hydraulics, every, you know, every project's a hydraulic project, and maybe structures feel the same way, that every project's really a structural project. Um, I guess I'm here to say that it's actually bigger than that. There's a system. So if there's one thing to take away from this presentation is to, you know, how do we bridge that gap to resilience? It's, it's looking at the bigger picture. It's looking at a holistic approach to designing our civil engineering problems. I mean, that's why we all got into this field, right? We are analytical. We solve problems. So um, I'm going to cover the 2013 flood event really high level for you. I'm going to talk about some of the opportunities. Um, you know, unfortunately, um, but I like to look at the glass half full, so I would say fortunately disasters bring um, new innovations, new thoughts, new methodologies, and it seems like every time a large event happens, I just talk with our chief data officer, you know, she came from New York after September 11th, and you know, how, how things change so much more aggressively. So we kind, of, we, we kind of move at a pace, and then a disaster happens, and we really sort of escalate, we change the way we think, the way we, um, you know, get things done, the processes we put in place. And you know, in government, we all know, I don't know how many of you guys, how many of you guys are state or local agencies versus private sector, right? So, you know, government, things take, they take time. Um, but you'll see after a disaster, we can move pretty quick. So I wanna talk about the opportunities that disaster does bring, and then talk about a couple of the case studies. So this is just some pictures, you know, after four years, I still don't get tired of looking of, you know, what mother nature truly can do. Um, so, and I tried to make these more um, structural in nature, but you know, the two, um, that was Dilly Dam up on the top left there. That was on the Big Thompson Canyon. 40 years prior to 2013, we hit a uh, 100 year event as well. Um, we lost, we lost over 100 people in that event. Um, this 2013 event was much different. It actually started on September 11th in 2013, and it didn't end until 20 or until September 18th. So we had about seven days of rain. Total different event for Colorado. We are used to the flash flooding. This was one of just those. It just rained and rained and rained and didn't and didn't stop, which actually created a lot of those problems that Ty mentioned. Those rock slides, those landslides heavy, heavy debris flow. We had 120,000 cubic yards of debris that had to get removed. We had 40, uh, 486 miles of highway closed when that rain happened. Um, of those, you know, close to 500 miles, we had about 112 of those damaged and severely damaged, damaged as you see like this. Um, we had about 200 bridges and culverts damaged. Statewide, we saw about, um, 
three billion dollars, and I think that number still s seems to move around, but that's between roadway infrastructure and our buildings. Um, and what I'm res in responsible charge for or of in uh, as Colorado Department of Transportation, and you know, I actually started at the floods as a consultant. I'm actually new to Colorado Department of Transportation. I've only been there for three years. Um, but I'm responsible for all of the federal assets. So we have about a $742 million program, and we're still in recovery, as, as Mike mentioned. So um, this bridge on the bottom was a local agency um, project. You know, we lost that bridge entirely. What you'll see in the top right picture is, you know, what we noticed is we lost a lot, lost a lot of our approaches to our bridges. So, you know, we have to look at this as an overall system. It's not just, it's not just the bridge. It's not just the roadway. It's not just the hydraulics. It's the overall system. Um, so, you know, Ty mentioned that road was closed for two and a half months. I can say. Um, the state did some amazing things. We cut a lot of red tape, and we had all of those roadways open by November 26. So in less than 90 days, we spent $90 million in ER um, construction. It was pretty amazing how the private sector, the contractors, and the state agencies were able to come together to make that happen. But as you can imagine, we were just opening up to the traveling public so people could get back to life as usual. None of the improvements were built with engineering drawings. They didn't take into account lessons learned. So this really gave us an opportunity to say, you know, how, how can we be better prepared in the future? How can we reduce our risk? You know, the economic impact when we lose a transportation system is huge. Even if you lose it for two hours, especially on an interstate, that economic impact is, is huge. <clears throat> to your state or to a local community. We've got farmers, we had rural populations. You know, they had 200 mile detours just to get home, just to get to work. Um, so the governor said, you know, we're gonna build back better, we're gonna build back smarter, and he put together this sort of Colorado re um, Resiliency and Recovery Office, and we created a Colorado Resiliency Framework, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. So what, did, what opportunities did it bring us? You know, what did this disaster um, do for us? Well, of course, since this is a flood event, and again, most of my presentation will be with regards to flood, but there are other natural threats, right? We talked about rockfall, landslides, there's avalanche, um, there's high winds and tornadoes, there's, there's man-made threats, um, IEDs. We have, a lot of we have a couple tunnels here that we have to be aware of. So, um, we're looking at the state of Colorado at a risk-based asset management program. I know we've all talked about the condition of assets. I think we've been doing that for a long time to look at a risk-based approach to the natural environment and those natural threats that are not, I mean, we can put statistics around it, we can put probability around it, but they're a little bit harder to gauge when it's gonna come. But we are smarter now. We can do some of this predictive modeling, and I think there's value in when we go through prioritizing how are we going to spend those dollars next, because for any of those, those of you that are asset managers, um, you realize our needs are so much greater than what we actually have funds for, that we have to make those tough choices, and it's not just about that condition of that asset. So we were able to do, you know, like I said, the last, the last event that happened in the Big Thompson Canyon um, was 40 years ago, 1976. You know, we were able to collect 40 more years of additional data. We did some more hydraulic studies. Um, we're finding that, you know, there were a lot of different methodologies used. We were able to be consistent with some of those methodologies as far as how we're designing what our flows are for our future structures and um, basically you know, the watersheds, and I guess I didn't mention this study right now has been done primarily in northeast um, Colorado. We had about a 200 mile by 50 mile area where all this rain fell, but um, it's sort of just a reminder that, you know, you don't need a disaster to sort of pioneer some of this, some of this logic and doing, taking some of these steps to be more proactive. Um, the big, the big takeaway, the big lesson learned for us is that, you know, CDOT couldn't do it alone. We had so many um, stakeholders and partnerships. And, you know, if you thought government moves slow in your own little silo, wait till you start collaborating with all of the other partners that you have to collaborate with. It, it takes time. But I promise you, in, a, in a, that tight fiscal world that we live in, 
we are going to come up with much better solutions if we're not doing them in our silos of excellence. If we really can think about the problem that we're trying to solve with a much bigger scope, a much bigger lens. Um, and you know, when we, you know, Ty mentioned he's got this small bucket of money for Rockfall. Well, when you when you put that Rockfall money with some asset bridge money and maybe with some surface treatment money, your solution. Um, you, know, you can do a lot more with those dollars than just spending those dollars on, you know, with the tunnel vision of I know how to run my asset management, you know, program. So, you know, again, what, what sort of new needs and new concepts emerge? So, you know, I'm going to ask a couple questions, not for you guys to answer now, but just for you to think about. You know, we have um, roadway overtopping out in the eastern plains. It's a given. We've got really, really wide floodplains, you know, stretching a mile long. Um, and so, you know, one solution would be, you know, large viaduct. We just bridge over all that and let the water pass. Well, most of us can't afford that. We can't afford to do that. So, you know, we need to understand where we can have those controlled overtoppings and, and what else can we do to our roadway structure to basically armor that to say, yeah, it's going to overtop. It's going to overtop probably every 10 year event, maybe 25 year event or 100 year event. Um, and then bridge replacements. Um, you know, we've identified additional risks with our studies of hydraulics. And then, you know, whether you believe in global warming, or any of that, the one thing we can say is we've seen more and more of these extreme weather events. It's, it's going to happen, and our need to respond quickly um, is, is going to be there. I mean, Colorado saw a Waldo Canyon fire in 2012, which led to flooding. Then a 2013 Black Forest fire, which led to flooding, a large 2013 flood event. We repeated that same area with a 2015 flood event. So as we were trying to go back and do our permanent repairs on the areas that we did temporary repairs are on it after 2013, we lost our roadways again. And then we had a 2016 rockfall event in Glen Canyon. And you know, here we are in 2017. I'm not going to be able to predict what's coming, but. Um, I hope we can get done with all the 2013 flood permanent repairs before anything else happens. Um, so, you know, what is resilience? And again, I, I mentioned that the Colorado Re Resiliency Working Group came up with a definition. And I'm going to read the definition because I think resilience has become a buzzword, in my opinion, like sustainability. Everyone's got their own definition of it, around it. But what does it really mean? And resilience is that ability of communities to rebound, positively adapt to, or thrive amidst challenging conditions or challenges, including disaster and climate change, and maintain quality of life, healthy growth, durable systems, and conservation of resources for present and future generations. So that's a mouthful. But I mean, really, it is that what's, what's our capacity to rebound? Because it's a given, natural or man-made disasters are going to happen. So how prepared are we to respond? Um, so, you know, resilience, the, the new business as usual. And, you know, I, as being part of this program now for four years, I found, you know, some of these practices we've already been doing. As engineers, we already do a lot of this stuff. So it's like, hey, this isn't some new idea. Don't go, you know, coining a phrase called resilience and, and take credit for the, all the civil engineering that we've been doing every day. But there is a little bit broader scope, a little bit bigger look. And again, if you can take one message away, it's, it's, really, it's really that. Have I, have I dotted all the I's? Have I crossed all the T's? Am I actually solving the right problem for this asset or for this location? So, you know, what resilience is, is we are taking that bigger look at that those, those extreme weather events. Um, we're assessing, assessing risks to assets. We're determining vulnerability. So vulnerability, what does that mean? What is, how vulnerable is our asset to a flood event? Um, you know, if you've designed a bridge to handle a 100-year event, and it can pass a 100-year event, and your studies are up to date, and your watersheds are up to date, and you didn't have a fire right upstream. Because if you had a fire right upstream, your 10-year event is acting like a 100-year event. So if you have that 25-year event, how vulnerable is your asset to that fire? And are you ready to, to handle you know, what sort of damage could, could be coming your way? Um, and then how do we prioritize those assets, knowing um, that you know, we've got risks to our assets? Um, and again, you know, Colorado has put a, a focus on this, and it's not just in the infrastructure world. It's in the community world. It's in our. It's in housing. Um, 
these little icons down here. Um, they've created basically six sectors, and it's community, health and social, um, economic, the watershed and natural resources, housing and infrastructure. And so it's, it's working together. Um, when we look at our floodplain um, areas, you know, it, it's about the planning process. We shouldn't be putting houses inside of our, our floodplain floodplain areas, but we, yet we continue to allow that, and so um, it's kind of a given what, what things are going to happen. So we've got to work together to do better planning, to be more resilient for the future. So um, CDOT's Risk and Resiliency Pilot, we actually kicked off to one as part of the 2013 event, and now we're doing the I-70 corridor, which looks at a little bit broader scope, 2013 specialized just in flooding. So again, it's for management and decision-making purposes. Um, risks is best defined um, or reflected as an annualized monetary expected loss from a threat uh, based on asset design characteristics, vulnerability, and probability of that event actually occurring. And resilience is, again, is reflected of a measure of loss. So what's, you know, um, what's a user cost if I-70 shuts down for 24 hours? <laughs> you know, what's, what's the, um, how redundant, do we have redundant routes? How quickly can we, can we get back, um, reestablish and get traffic moving through there? So, and then we look at criticality. We look at it, the triple bottom line. It's not just um, the infrastructure. It's, it's the social impacts, it's the economic impacts, and it's in those environmental impacts. Um, <clears throat> so, one of the things that we, we really observed is this, this sort of the trends in, in resilience is we can no longer look, you know, as at the man-made solution. It is that interface between the man-made solution and the natural environment and what system sort of bridges those two together, what works the best. And so, you know, one of the questions is how, how can the British industry move the needle forward on trying, in, on tying into natural solutions that accommodate larger events. And we can talk about what some of that looks like. This is one of the concepts that we're using up in those canyons. Um, you know, when our flood hit, we had the 100-year floodplain above our roadway surfaces in a lot of areas. Um, everywhere we had our roadway on embankment, as one would expect, we lost all that roadway. Where we had roadway on bedrock, our roadway still, still was there. And so we're looking at, you know, uh, blasting out some rock, putting it into on the floodplain side to um, protect that, and elevating the roadway out of the floodplain. However, this is an expensive solution, but it does work. Um, again, some current practices versus new practices. You know, we, we've always increased bridge capacities to convey flow. Um, we've used revetment to armor our banks. And we've incorporated high, you know, hydraulic drops in the river to sort of dissipate some of that energy. But what are some of the new practices that we're looking at? We're looking at, let's get the roadway alignment just out of the floodplain entirely. Let's get it out of the way. We're not gonna beat mother nature. So let's, let's, play, let's play with her and, and move it to, to a safer location. Um, we're using rock base as our, as our base, instead of embankment or instead of ABC, we're actually using a rock bed, so we're just gonna allow that water to overtop. And even if it rips off the asphalt, we still have a nice road base that we can come back in, get some um, you know, gravel down, and we can get traffic and we can get um, cars moving again before we can get there and pave. If we just put it back on regular you know, R40 material, that's gone. It's all gone, it's down the river, you know, 100 miles. Um, and then consider design alternatives uh, based on the best solution. You know, it's not, always, it's not always a structural solution. Sometimes it might just be to do nothing. So here's a couple case studies um, just to show you some examples of some of the damage that we saw. This is uh, 6257, an intersection here um, in Millican out east. We did not lose these bridges. Uh, the bridges were actually fine. There was hardly any structural damage. Um, but we lost all the approaches and all the embankment leading up up to those bridges. We did a 1D model that said, hey, if I widen these bridges, I can pass this flow and, and, um, and not flood the town of Millican. Town of Millican sort of sits, um, as you can see it right there on the bottom um, right-hand corner of the screen. Um, <clears throat> however, the ER program does not pay for assets that aren't damaged. Um, they're not gonna pay for us to replace a bridge when we didn't, the bridge wasn't damaged. So that's where we piloted the R&R program and we were able to justify that by replacing that bridge, we were gonna cause far less damage in the future. Um, we were gonna save, because FEMA had to come in and do housing. There's a, um, a, a neighborhood there 
all of them lost their housing there. And so, you know, FEMA and FHWA, they don't always, you know, those monies, those dollars, those colors of money don't always work together. And it, you know, how one color of money is described, you should use it, doesn't always work for the other. But this is an area where we worked with FEMA and said, yeah, we, we and we work with CWCB. We, there's a channel that runs between 257 and State Highway 60 that's sort of at a 90 degree bend. You can sort of see it at the bottom of the screen. Anyways, it makes sort of a 90 degree bend. We had to, um, realign that channel, we, we use CWC money for that, and then we used ER funds to um, basically replace those bridges. That picture on the bottom left is a picture of the town of Millican at that intersection flooding. Here's another case study out in the Eastern Plains. This is State Highway 71. This is an area where we, you know, that roadway is going to continue to overtop. Um, we use that rock base. Um, as a solution, and in fact, we were repairing State Highway 71. We had already repaired State Highway 39 using that rock base, but we did not do that on State Highway 71. The 2015 event came through. We lost State Highway 71 again. State Highway 39 worked great. So that sort of became our new best practice. Here's some pictures during 2015, and here's that rock base going in, and you can see in that upper typical section that's sort of what we feel is now a best practice on how to deal with the Eastern Plains. Here's a case study in Greeley. This is an area where the South Platte, at the top of the picture, that's the channel alignment. Um, that is where the, the South Platte is supposed to go. However, it leaves its banks after a 25-year event, and it comes down to this bottom corner. There was nothing there in this. This was just embankment. It's my understanding that the noise when this failure happened was pretty, pretty loud, like a loud bomb went off. Um, this is another picture of that, of that flood. Again, we never had a bridge here. We never had culverts here. How were we able to justify putting in a new asset? Again, we ran it through that risk and resiliency process to justify why the right solution in this location was to build a bridge. And for, you know, 99% of the time, this bridge is going to sit dry. However, in the 2015 event, it just showed that we, it was worth spending that money because again, we saw flooding um, in that 2015 event. This is just an area, some construction in US 36 where we basically moved the roadway over and are sort of spending you know, some of those dollars in establishing um, that channel, putting root wads in, um, basically giving the river room to breathe. That's what we kind of learned. Anywhere that river's constrained, as one can imagine, it's a lot stronger. Um, it's gonna rip out that roadway. It's gonna rip out any assets. Um, again, Big Thompson, same solution. That green is the rock cut, and then we're going to shift the alignment over. Um, this is a solution here on Big Thompson Canyon where the, the river is on an outside bend. Anywhere where we had the river, you know, the roadway on the outside of a river, it's one, again, you know, this is not, this is not rocket science. We lost all of that, but we said, you know, let's not, let's not fight it. And in, in this solution, we did, we decided to bridge the river, and we're just going to let the river do what it needs to do. Um, so this is just a rendering, and this project's currently under construction. Um, and we, you know, blasted part of that mountain, mountain and have, um, have put two new bridges in place. One other, you know, area, a lot of lessons learned, but what you can see here are some small access bridges. In fact, these access bridges, um, they didn't fail. In fact, they were quite robust, but they acted like dams, um, and they, they killed our asset. They, they were the ones that took out the highway. So, you know, a bunch of, and it was because all these bridges, because the local agencies, their requirement was you only need to pass a 25-year event. Well, for this canyon, it pretty much sees 100-year events and about 2- to 10-year events. It rarely sees a 25-year event. So um, we have done a R&R &R analysis as well um, on these access bridges because the ER program, it's not a federal asset. We're not gonna pay to, to replace those access bridges, especially if they weren't lost. However, we were able to justify that says if this bridge stays in place and acts as a dam again, the amount of armament and protection we would need to do on our asset is more expensive than if we just go in and put a 100-year bridge in. And so in some locations, um, we're actually replacing those access bridges on the 34 um, Big Thompson Canyon. This is one other location where, again, you can see how those access bridges basically were the, 
were one of the root causes of all the damage that we saw on our, on our highway. In this so solution, we're actually eliminating one of the structures and combining it to make one hundred year structure for these uh, private property owners. So, you know, my closing remarks is, you know, how do you bridge the gap to resilience? You know, it's, it's just recognition, recognition that your bridge is part of a larger system. Um, you know, we all, we all have to break out of our silo of ex excellence and communicate and collaborate with our partners because I think better solutions um, come from that. Um, you know, you got to learn the risk and resilience of that asset. I think, you know, just solving the condition of the asset is your short sighting what that solution can be. You know, it could be a lot more vulnerable than you realize. And um, appreciate that solution may not always be structural in nature. You, you mentioned prioritizing uh, these different locations. Can you talk a little bit about how you prioritize? Because you, you mentioned triple bottom line. Um, were you doing an economic analysis? Was this a monetization of benefit? How exactly did you prioritize? So um, what we did for the ER program is a little bit different than what we're going to do for um, our risk-based asset management approach. Um, and I'll talk about that because I think the ER is specific to the ER program. But, um, and it's a pilot program what we're doing, but we are coming up um, with criticality. And we have come up with criticality of our roadways. And it considers AADT of the roadway. So what's your volume on that roadway? What's the roadway classification? Um, is it a you know, national defense route? Um, things like that. It takes into account um, SOVI, which is the social vulnerability. So some of these communities, that is their only roadway in and out of their community. So that's the, sort of that social aspect. We have redundancy, so that has to do with if this point gets closed, are there other redundant routes um, in place? There's six, there's six classifications, so it's, oh, freight. So what's, our, what's the volume of freight? So that's sort of that economic, um, those economic characteristics, how much, and tourism. So those are sort of the six categories that we are using to um, characterize um, our assets and we basically have a, of a, a classification of one, two, and three, like highly critical, medium critical, and low criticality. Um, however, your threats and your risks, you might have a low critical asset with a high threat or a high critical asset with a low threat. And we are halfway through our risk and resiliency pilot, but that's what we're trying to figure out. We have not yet figured. We, there is no funding of money that, you know, this is sort of a unfunded mandate when they say you need to think about resiliency and a risk-based management approach. There's no additional dollars that are coming to us, you know, prioritizing projects through, hey, there's a high risk at this asset, so therefore there's a bucket of money we can pick from. No, so we um, you know, our next step is to work with our asset managers to say, now that we know which, you know, where our critical routes are, and now that we know where our highest threats are, what are we going to do about prioritizing those and overlay them with the condition of those assets? So that's, we're, again, about halfway through the process. Come September, I think we're going to have a lot more answers on that pilot. I was just wondering how you compared uh, moving the roadway. You avoided the floodplain, but then... Um, by cutting into the rocks would seem to aggravate the rock fall? You're correct. And in fact, we had, you know, initially when we went, when we kind of laid this out, when our roadway engineers laid this out, I'll, I'll pick on us for a little bit, um, we had rock cuts everywhere, everywhere. And I remember looking at it and I'm thinking to myself, I think we're creating more risk for the traveling public by cutting rock at all these locations, not to mention the cost. We had really steep canyon walls. And so yes, it took an approach. And in some locations, we, we have strategically worked with our geotech engineers to find where are those rocks most stable? Where are the right locations to do an actual rock cut and rock blast? And in other areas, we negated that idea altogether. That horseshoe bend is one of those areas where we did look at a rock blast. We looked at moving the roadway away. It just wasn't the right solution. We decided two bridges, and then granted, there's two more assets that we gotta, gotta take care of, but it was the long-term right solution. So it was a collaborative solution, <laughs> for sure. Well, thank you.